My talk this evening is to be an American tale. In other words, my own experience in becoming deep in the history of the Catholic Church in America. And as I prepared for this talk, reading dozens of invaluable books and websites, of course, on the history of the Catholic Church in the early years of the American colonies, I became overwhelmed, and I mean that absolutely seriously, overwhelmed with the wealth of information that sadly only a minority of Americans today knows. And I can only admit that the American tale of this lifelong American is one of truncated ignorance. As I prepared, I became stymied in my decision as to how much of this great stuff to include and what to ignore. And fortunately, I could rest on the knowledge that I can leave most, most of this to the other speakers of the weekend. <laughs> Qualified speakers. So what should my approach be in this introduction? What should be my angle? In time it became obvious that it should be driven by the theme of the work of our apostolate, conversion. The Coming Home Network was established 14 years ago to help non-Catholic clergy and laity come home to the Catholic Church. So when we examine the coming of the faith to the Americas, to what extent were there conversions during this period, not just to Jesus Christ, but conversions to the Catholic Church? Now, I won't be discussing the missions, the conversions of the Native American Indians. I'm going to leave that to other speakers this weekend. But rather, I want to focus specifically on the colonial Puritan New England pioneers, the universal majority of whom were non-Catholic Protestants, of course, of many shades, lay and clergy. Were there any conversions during those many years to the Catholic Church? Now, as a background I, to this, I think it's good for us to review for a moment why we started these Deep in History conferences. There were at least two things that inspired these conferences, this is the fifth of which. The first is the looming 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. You may not realize that, but on October 31st, 2017, it will be the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther's posting of his 95 theses on the Wittenberg church door. And there will be celebrations everywhere. And so we Catholics got a lot to do to get ready, to learn, to understand, so that we can make sure that people truly understand what that 500th anniversary means. But there's a second reason. And it's a statement made by John Henry Cardinal Newman in the opening of his book on the essay on the development of doctrine. He said, the audacity, that to become deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. My own experience and that of the majority of those hundreds of converts that I've been interviewing over the last 10 years on the Journey Home program, all of us would agree wholeheartedly with John Henry Cardinal uh, Newman's statement that becoming deep in history paved our way home to the church. Newman, however, probably did not intend his statement to be taken universally and literally. That was his own personal experience. He probably did not mean that every single person who becomes deep in history automatically becomes a Catholic, or the flip side, that the reason some people aren't Catholic, of course, is because they aren't deep in history. Frankly, there are many, many people who are very deep in history, sincere believers, well-read, PhDs, who yet have no opening at all in their heart to the Catholic Church. Now think about that. Why not? What keeps them from coming home? Well, I thought of five reasons. But first of all, before I get to the five, 
I have to admit and presume that most of my old Protestant buddies would answer that question, duh. It's obvious. You see, they believe that history and scripture and theology and experience are all on their side. They staunchly disagree with John Henry Cardinal Newman's statement and with all of us here. To a certain extent, this is another debate for another time, obviously, but yet, it is also exactly to the point of what our weekend is all about. How can sincerely believing Christians see all the data that we see, yet have no interest at all in coming home to the Catholic Church? Over the years, the Coming Home Network, we've identified at least 16 barriers to conversion. And if you want to know what those are, you can buy the tape in the lobby. But the top three of that list of 16 has, rising to the top, has always been the same three. And I actually want you to remember these three in the back of your mind throughout my entire talk. Ignorance, misinformation, and bad Catholics. Ignorance meaning they didn't have the data. Many of our Protestant friends just don't have the data. Number two, misinformation. The data they have is wrong. But thirdly, bad Catholics. And what I mean by that is one of two things. Either the Catholics they know don't act like Christians, or they don't understand their, their acts of piety. Protestants don't understand mantillas and beads and kneeling and statues. It looks like idolatry. So still, good Catholics may not look like Christians to our separated brethren. So specifically, the five reasons why many who are deep in history don't come home to the Catholic Church. The first has to do with ignorance. You see, it really isn't easy to become deep in history. One might assume that it's easier today to become deep in history because our information age and technology. But actually, I think it's much harder. When Newman became deep in history, bookstores and publishers were, were much less. He didn't have a Barnes and Nobles right across the street with everything under the sun. And they were also very selective. And Newman was certainly not hindered by modern distractions, right? Like television, internet, computer games, and Saturday and Sunday afternoon football games. Today, however, there is far too much readily available information and so little time. Every subject, no matter how insignificant, has more than enough available information to fill a lifetime. And it's hard to become truly deep in anything, let alone history. I'll give you an example. Ten years ago, my family and I moved to 10 acres on my wife's old family farm. Now that's 25 acres. And all of a sudden, I discovered a hobby. Farming! <laughs> I have no experience whatsoever in farming. But I mean, what's, so, what's so hard about farming, right? I mean, pfft, I buy a couple books, I read them, and I just do it. Right. I would give anything to have just this much of the knowledge of any lifelong FFA student. They know thousands times more than I do. And one example is with my tractor. I have a wonderful tractor. I do almost everything on the tractor, even just ride it for joy. <laughs> but one of the things I do, of course, is plow the driveway. And Two winters ago, I, in a big storm, I was ready to start plowing the driveway, and I got the tractor out of my barn, and nothing worked. It turned on, but all the hydraulics were frozen. I couldn't lower or raise anything. I couldn't figure out what to do. I came to the conclusion that water must have got into my hydraulics and frozen, and so therefore it probably wouldn't work till spring. So all winter, I'm doing it the manual way, we're driving through deep snow, just getting best, through winter the best we can. Come spring, I took my tractor into the dealer. There's a problem here. The hydraulics are frozen. Water must have gotten in the lines, can't get it to work. He looks at it. There's nothing wrong with your tractor. What do you mean? He said, there's nothing. 
Did you turn off your hydraulics? <laughs> what do you mean? He reached down under behind the front seat, did something, and all of a sudden everything went meow. <laughs> everything worked perfectly. What was that? He says, you mean you didn't know there's a knob under your seat to turn on or off the hydraulics? No. He says, well, somebody must have just turned that off. Uh, no one told me about that. I didn't read it in any of my books. None of my sons are FFA students yet. The moral of the story is that we can think we are very deep in something, that we have read all the right books, but yet still be very blind to an awful lot of important essential information. It's hard to become truly deep in history and also very easy to miss the key essential facts. Second reason, and this has to do with misinformation, many scholars may be hindered by their culture, their situation, their prejudice, which shapes their reading. Our presumptions can shape our choice of books can limit our focus, can cause us to discount important information. In a sense, a scholar's primary sphere of interest can actually push the Catholic Church to the periphery and he never notices it. Remember the Where Was Waldo books, right? You gotta focus on that page. Thousands of these goofy caricatures, you're trying to find that goofy little guy with the red and white striped shirt and the, and the, and the cap, right? And you find him. And when you're all done, some idiot asks you, did you see any guys in blue shirts? You weren't looking for guys in blue shirts. You're looking for a guy with a red and white striped shirt. You haven't a clue. Were there guys in blue shirts? I don't know. I was glancing over every other person to find the guy in the red and white shirt. You see, many who are well educated in history may not have seen the wealth of Catholic data right in front of them because they were focusing on other things. Thirdly, and this has to do with bad Catholics, many scholars do not know deeply committed intellectual Catholics who are interested in sharing their faith. They may know Catholic students, neighbors, family members, even Catholic history scholars, but too many of them may be Catholics in name only, not giving a convincing model of Christianity or they, these friends, Catholic friends, may feel too intimidated to talk to this high scholar about Catholic things. Or maybe the scholar has no close Catholic friends. They only know Catholics in the Catholic Church from afar. A fourth reason, and this one struck me at home, and they may have become deep in history for all the wrong reasons. They may have gathered historical information for school, for passing tests, to write their dissertation, for advancement, for preparing lectures or, or sermons, for curiosity, even to become known, to write, to be able to answer all comers. But as Father John Grohl wrote about 200 years ago, he warned that this can all be very dangerous. In his book, Spiritual Maxims, Father Grohl writes on the importance of developing the habit of recollection, how important recollection is to our spiritual growth. And he said, he said, it is necessary to accustom oneself to exercise great restraint over one's eyes, so as to acquire the power of turning them, not only from dangerous, but from distracting and diverting objects. Intellectual curiosity is dangerous and if we foster the habit of recollection, we must learn to keep it within bounds. By intellectual curiosity, I mean that immoderate desire to acquire knowledge, which causes people to study avidly the various sciences and nearly always superficially. They devour every book as it comes out more to show off than to improve their minds. A person can gain lots of head knowledge without touching the heart. St. Paul also addressed this in his first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 10. Now these things happen to them, he means the Old Testament folk, as a warning. But they were written down 
for our instruction, upon whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. The historical accounts in the scriptures were given to us as a warning for our instruction, but you know, so is all of history. The primary reason for this Deep in History conference is not so we can merely fill our minds with more knowledge, but rather so we can grow in our intimacy with God and in holiness. We learn, not just so we can know or so that we can be known, but so that we can truly know him and how he works in this world to bring all people closer to him. And then a fifth reason, and maybe this most important reason, and that is the mystery of grace. Even though all the converts that I know would agree with John Henry Cardinal Newman's statement, yet we also would agree that it was not becoming deep in history that opened our hearts and minds to the Catholic Church, but rather God's grace, his merciful grace, that first opened our hearts and minds to then see and understand what we didn't or couldn't see before. Does that make sense? It's grace first. Sixteen years ago, when I was a Presbyterian pastor, in love with Jesus, but on my way to the Catholic Church, I was hungry. I'd been hit by grace. I was reading history and the early church fathers and great books by Hilaire Belloc and Carl Keating and just, just eating them all up, loving them. I even found some scriptures that I never saw before. But I also found myself angry. Angry that all this had been kept from me. Why didn't someone tell me? Then later I had the time to re-examine some of those old history books I had from seminary. Even a copy of the Apostolic Fathers I read in seminary. And guess what? It was all there. I just didn't see it. Either I didn't want to see it or I couldn't see it. Grace must first open our hearts and minds, and then the reading of history comes alive, confirming that which we have already come to realize is true by grace. One of the reasons for these deep in history conferences, of course, is to give you information, to fill in the gaps, to give you tools that you can use in evangelization. But even more so, we are here to offer times of prayer, worship, fellowship, resources, and encouragement so that grace can continue to open our hearts and minds to Jesus Christ and his church so that we can learn historical tools that the Spirit might be able to use in the lives of others. All right, now to the meat of my talk. <laughs> the American tales, good thing I might talk goes on to one in the morning. Now, and I still have to delay a bit, because I have to admit that until November 1991, when I was almost 40, I never considered the validity of the Roman Catholic Church. Never crossed my mind. I had never knowingly read a book about the Catholic faith. I never talked with a Catholic about the Catholic faith. Even in seminary, we never discussed what Catholics truly believe. I was essentially ignorant of the Catholic faith. I was never overtly, consciously anti-Catholic. I never uttered out loud the anti-Catholic stuff that I remember. But I had accepted the usual anti-Catholic claims, though I can't remember where I learned them. I know I didn't get them from my parents. I may have picked them up when I studied Luther's shorter catechism. But again, I don't recall but the point is that my view of the Catholic Church was full of misinformation. Remember that second barrier. I also knew very few Catholics, and those that I knew, especially in college, were not models of faithfulness. <laughs> I won't explain. <laughs> but I also need to mention that up until age 40, I never heard of a non-Catholic minister becoming Catholic. I knew of many Catholics, lay and clergy, who had become Protestant. In fact, 30% of the congregations that I pastored were all ex-Catholics. 
But the only Protestants I knew who became Catholics did so through marriage. And of course, I presume that if they really knew their faith well, they wouldn't have left it in the first place. I was like those that presumed that becoming deep in history would automatically and certainly make one Protestant. Well, now at age 55, although it cracks me up, you know, whenever I go out to speak, I've mentioned this before, people always say I look so much thinner in real life than on TV, you know? <laughs> so much younger in real life. You know, so much more handsome, in real, so much taller in real life. And that always makes me think that on TV I must look short, fat, and ugly. <clears throat> but now, at age 55, and a Catholic for nearly 15 years, it's not easy remembering what I learned way back then as a child about American history, and particularly the coming of the Catholic faith to America. Essentially, I learned American history, now think about this, from a very narrow perspective as if what was important about America came through a channel from England to New England to Ohio. That's what was important. I certainly learned about the early explorers from Norway, Spain, Portugal, France, Holland, as well as England, but I remember no discussion about their Catholic roots. Instead, we learned of the greed and the cruelty of the conquistadors from Spain but we never learned about the missions of the priest in Mexico, New Mexico, Arizona, or California, or never about Our Lady of Guadalupe. We learned about the French explorers and their fur trade with the Indians, but nothing about the Catholic missions with the Indians in Canada, Michigan, Ohio, and Maine. Like many, I believe that the true evangelical faith came to America from England or Holland through the Puritans, pilgrims in 1620 on the Mayflower. And of course, we celebrate that every year. If pushed, I'm sure I could have recalled those earlier Spanish and French settlements, but generally I focused on the Puritan New England colonies. In all my years of studying American history, the Catholic Church and Catholics were rarely mentioned. And this is a, an important point of my talk. Many Catholics may presume that Protestants are always thinking anti-Catholic thoughts. No, you're not in our minds. <laughs> you aren't our worries anymore. We're battling amongst ourselves. In my religious training, the Roman Catholic Church was always on the periphery, either as a threat to political or religious freedom, or as the prime example of how religion can go bad, tainted by superstitions, pride, immorality, works righteous theology, or power-hungry prelates. Catholics were generally pigeonholed with the Jewish and Islamic faiths, ancient but incomplete or in error. Even in seminary, as far as the history of the church in America, I remember our focus primarily being on the church in New England. I studied in seminary in New England. And this may be because my minor in seminary was the Puritans. That's what I studied. See, the Waldo I was looking for was always the Puritans. I missed everybody else. Consequently, my attention was usually within the sphere of Protestantism. Congregationalism, Presbyterians, Anabaptists, Quaker, Church of England, various independents, and then the, always on the constant battle between the liberals and the conservatives amongst Protestants, the old school, the new school. Roman Catholicism was essentially a relic of the past, overturned with the dust kicked off our feet, and those countries that were still enslaved by Romanism, France and Spain, were always our natural enemies, the enemies of political and religious freedom. Did this sound like anything you heard growing up, any of you? That's the way I learned it. But then when grace opened my heart and mind to the truth of the Catholic Church, I began reading history all over again. And not just church history, but all aspects of world and American history to discover what had, I had not learned correctly. And one thing I did when I joined the church to kind of 
make a concrete expression of my commitment to righting this wrong is that when I, when I entered the church, I took as my patron saint, St. Isaac Jogues. You know, the great French missionary martyr to the Huron Indians. And I did that because until I was age 40, I had never heard of him. I'd never heard of him, and I was ashamed. And I took him as my patron saint with the prayer that I would always have the same zeal that he had to spread the gospel. Now I'd like to, I also learned one last thing, before I get into the talk. <laughs> what was time we have? I also learned in a way I had never previously realized why during the entire colonial period in New England from 1620 until 1789, from the colonies until the ratification of the Constitution, there were essentially no Catholics in Puritan New England. Essentially none. Now I'd like to approach the subject, and I'm just going to scratch the surface, and we're not going to be here for four more hours. I'm just going to scratch the surface, and I'm going to look at this under six headings. Let me give you those headings. They're, they kind of make sense. Number one, what did these colonists bring with them? What was their thinking when they came in relationship to the Catholic Church? Number two, what they, why did they come here to these shores? Number three, what did they do once they arrived? Number four, how did they learn new things? Once they're here in this wilderness, how did they continue to learn, especially in relationship to the Catholic Church? Number five, had they found their new Jerusalem away from the Roman Catholic Church? And then number six, given all this, what about conversions to the Catholic Church? Were there any Catholic conversions in the early days of America? Number one, what did they bring with them? What was their thinking in relationship to the Roman Catholic Church? You see, as a result of the Protestant Reformation on the continent as well as in England, they were thoroughly convinced in what has been called the black legend, which consists of all the usual anti-Catholic stuff that we still hear all the time, right? The Pope is the Antichrist, the Roman Catholic Church is the Whore of Babylon, the Mass is an abomination of superstition, idolatry, Catholics have been blinded by the traditions of man and have ignored or abused the scriptures. Throughout history, Catholics have demonstrated bloodthirsty and cruel violence. But add to this, they believed with nervous convictions that Catholics regard the Pope's authority as superior to the English king and government, and that Catholics are constantly trying, even in secret, to reestablish the Catholic government. And this led to great fear. Rapid anti-Catholicism had been constantly inflamed in England by works like John Fox's Book of Martyrs, which detailed hundreds of Protestants who had been burned between 1555 and 1558 under Queen Mary. They had a different name for her. These fears were intensified by tales of the 1605 gunpowder plot in which a group of Catholics supposedly planned to blow up King James I and Parliament, but failed when their scheme was discovered. Also, in the 16th century, the English had begun their efforts to subdue the Catholics in Ireland. The English justified their violent and cruel actions because they believed that the Gaelic Irish Catholic Papists were an unreasonable and culturally inferior people. Maintaining this false belief, the English Protestants considered themselves innocent of all normal ethical constraints, restraints. This attitude remained in the minds of those who came to the American colonies, shaping how they would then deal with the Native American Indians. And when you read the primary sources, the words that they use to describe the American Indians as civil, uncivilized pagan is the exact same words the English used to describe the Irish. 
But in many ways, they had already relegated, quote, papists to the ranks of Turks and heathen folk. Robert Brown, the father of English congregationalism, rejected all authority except the Bible, the Word of God, in 1582. Now remember, 1530s was the English Reformation. This is two generations later. After the English Reformation, he published pamphlets defining congregationalism beliefs versus the Church of England and other Protestant beliefs and doesn't even mention the Catholic Church. In the immediate concerns of daily life, the Roman Catholic Church has already been shifted outside of focus. And I think that's an important part. Often we read in early church documents, it doesn't mention the Catholic Church, so some modern revisionists want to say, see, they weren't anti-Catholic, they weren't talking about the Catholic Church. The reality, they were so anti-Catholic, they didn't have to mention it. But number two, why did they come to this continent? As we've all learned, they were escaping conflict with the Church of England. They were bothered that the established church, in fact, wasn't Protestant enough. For there were far too many lingering Catholic practices and beliefs, and things weren't moving in the right direction. They were especially concerned, for example, when King James I, himself very anti-Catholic, passed penal laws versus all nonconformists, not just the Catholics, but all of those, quote, dissenters, forcing them to look elsewhere for religious freedom. They were also concerned because James I was attempting to gain Catholic Spain as an ally. That's scary. And with the scheduled end of the truce between Holland and Catholic Spain looming in the near future, 1629, they were afraid of what might happen the Spanish Inquisition might come back to our shores. And so these and other fears and dreams led to a major exodus to New England beginning in 1630. Now, in my talk, I'm not referring to those southern colonies in Jamestown and Virginia. I'm just looking at New England, Puritan New England. Within a decade of 1630, 10 years, Close to 20,000 men and women had migrated to settlements in Massachusetts and Connecticut. Third, what did they do when they got here? Well, the majority of, of these 20,000 were English Puritans who came to establish a new Jerusalem, a truly biblically based religious colony. They may have come specifically to escape persecution under the Church of England, but when you read their stuff, behind it all, they saw always the lingering roots of papism. For example, in 1677, about two generations later, Peter Chamberlain wrote that the first intentions of the colonies of New England were to suppress sin and idolatry and prevent all the adulteries of Rome to whom all things are lawful, especially lies and hypocrisy. Later in 1702, Cotton Mather, we've all heard of Cotton Mather, wrote in his book Magnalia Christi Americana that, quote, pilgrims and other planters came to raise up a bulwark against the kingdom of Antichrist, which the Jesuits labor to rear up in all places of the world. Though congregationalists in polity, all these little colonies, and that meant that every individual church was autonomous and could vote and decide for itself and rule itself, and Calvinist in theology, very much committed to predestination, for example, there were two different kinds of Puritans. There were the, the non-separating Puritans and the separating Puritans. Up in Massachusetts Colony, you have the non-separating Puritans who believed in reform within the Church of England, but that it was wrong to separate. And whenever you see them use the word reform, what they mean was, we've got to keep stripping away all that leftover Catholic stuff. And the separating Puritans who were down in Plymouth believed that the Church of England was so corrupt and again, when you read corrupt, you mean that it's so papist that true believers must separate themselves. Since so we have these different viewpoints already in New England, and though there was great diversity of theology and polity amongst the various colonial groups, they were united with their hatred for the Church of England because it seemed too papist, for the Stuarts, 
those kings and queens and pretenders that were always trying to get back in the throne and, and they believed they'd bring back Catholicism and of course the Roman Catholic Church. To ensure religious freedom, and this is ironic, to ensure religious freedom, they essentially institutionalized Protestantism. Okay? They built meeting houses, not churches, no crosses, no statues, no symbols, meeting houses that were used for many purposes. They established laws regulating religious ideas and practice. A great book that I read, which it's too bad it's out of print, called Catholicism in New England to 1788 by a Father Riley. It was his dissertation at Catholic University in the 1930s. Excellent book. He says this, that during the whole colonial period, the entire population in New England were required by law to attend at least the Sunday and fast day services. And you Catholics thought you had it hard. In Massachusetts Bay Colony, for example, in 1635, this is only within 10 years of the planting of the colony, those neglecting published worship were penalized with imprisonment or a five shilling fine. Legislations like this were frequently reenacted in all the New England colonies, except Rhode Island, and that's another story. They were committed to freedom of religion, though, in a twisted way. Well into the 18th century, there were these laws. In the 17th and 18th centuries, the English government enacted the Oaths of Allegiance and Supremacy, 1606, the Declaration Against Transubstantiation in 1673, the Test Act, 1678, the later Oaths of Abjuration in 1707, and other controls to specifically exclude Catholics from enjoying political and civil freedom. In 1606, Pope Paul V condemned the oath of allegiance and supremacy, stating that English Catholics could not take this oath under penalty of mortal sin. It actually was impossible for a loyal Catholic to take any of these oaths that were required on all English citizens. For example, the Test Act of 17, or 1678, here's how it begins. I, state your name, do solemnly and sincerely in the presence of God profess, testify, and declare that I do believe that in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper there is not any transubstantiation of the elements of bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. And if that is required to be a citizen, what Catholic can take that? The basic charters of all the New England colonies, except Rhode Island, ordered the administration of the oaths to effect the same end, and therefore no faithful Catholic could live as a free man in New England until the ratification of the Constitution in 1787. Four, how did these new colonial people learn new things, expand their minds, especially in relationship to the Catholic Church? Essentially, the primary sources for all new information and learning in the colonies for the average man were sermons, catechisms, school books, Bibles, almanacs, and other books. In general, and this is an important point, that it really struck me as I read this, found this in all my readings, most of these sources ignored any mention of the Catholic Church. You see, they've come all the way over here. And they left the Catholic Church over there. Instead, they focused on Puritan theology versus other Protestant beliefs. The battle's here. However, those sources that did mention the Roman Catholic Church were vehemently anti-Catholic, and they were very popular and very influential. So in other words, it was the few voices that actually had the biggest voice in what New Englanders believed. For example, the sermons. As I mentioned earlier, the entire New England population was required by law to attend at least Sunday and fast days, and I'm quite sure they weren't 10-minute homilies. So the leadership recognized the power of the sermon to lead and influence both for religious as well as political change. The preachers were the most educated men of New England. I wish I had time to detail 
all the very well-known Protestant preachers and what they wrote and what they said. I can't do that, obviously, but their names you're sound familiar with. John Cotton, Increase Mather, Cotton Mather, they were all related one way or the other. They had great influence. Their sermons were published, and they were all vehemently Catholic. In fact, a man by the name of Cotton Mather, he wrote a little book about witchcraft, and it was what sparked the problem up in Salem. I'd also like to mention, though, something I found fascinating. We even had, maybe any Harvard grads here? Just curious. I'd like to mention what was called the famous Dudleyan Lectures of Harvard, which continue to this day. In the mid-1700s, a judge by the name of Paul Dudley established in his will a foundation to provide for a series of lectures at Harvard College to oppose the growing enemies of Protestantism. At the time, the ones out in front were the growing liberalism and deism. These lectures were to consist of recurrent groups of four lectures delivered on specific religious subjects. One lecture, though, out of each group was, quote, for the detecting, convicting, and exposing of the idolatry errors and superstitions of the Romish church, end of quote. And the anti-Catholic nature of these lectures lingered off and on until into the 19th century at Harvard. The Puritan sermons and lectures on a weekly basis fed the anti-Catholic presumptions and fears of the New England colonies. The catechisms, there were many of them, and most did not mention Catholicism at all, but like the sermons, the key and most influential catechisms written by many of these influential preachers were stridently anti-Catholic. I've got a long quote here from one where it lists every single imaginable anti-Catholic thing you can imagine. I won't read it now, but it was read and memorized by those early Puritan young people when they came into the church. The school books were written for educating the young were much like the catechisms. Usually they didn't focus on Catholic things, yet many included non-Catholic poems. Let me read this one. This comes from the New England Primer. It was published in 1737, 1770, 1771, right up before the Reformation. Child, behold the man of sin, the Pope, worthy thy utmost hatred. Thou shalt find in his head A, heresy, in his shoulders B, the supporters of his order, in his heart C, malice, murder, and treachery, in his arms D, cruelty, in his knees E, false worship and idolatry, in his feet F, swiftness to shed blood, in his stomach G, insatiable covetousness, in his loins H, the worst of lusts. And then a very famous poem called the Johnny Rogers Verses, Abhor that errant whore of Rome and all her blasphemies. Drink not of her cursed cup. Obey not her decrees. So the young children of New England memorized those. And this is it. Well, I gotta be careful. The most common book, of course, in the colonies was what? The Bible. Everybody had a Bible. And though most Englishmen used the authorized King James Version of 1611, the Puritans preferred an earlier book called the Geneva Bible, which had been published in 1599. And they liked it for one reason. It was the first Bible to use chapters and verses. I don't know if you knew that. But it was popular because it had lots of marginal notes that the King James didn't have. And those marginal notes were written by all the Reformation leaders back on the continent, John Knox and John Calvin, and these notes were both pro-Calvinist, which the Church of England didn't like, and very anti-Catholic. Let me read you a quote, for example, the footnote to Revelation 11.7 states, the beast that cometh out of the bottomless pit is the Pope which hath his power out of hell and cometh thence. You know, a lot of times I found this even as a pastor that people some usually believe that the notes were as inspired as the text. If it says it in the Bible, it must be true. There were no newspapers printed or even allowed in the colonies until the 1704 production of the Boston News Ledger. Instead, less newsworthy almanacs filled the void, and hardly any colonial home was without them. It's, Benjamin Franklin wasn't the first. There were tons of them, lots of publishers, lots of writers, 
Most of them, like I said before, didn't mention the Catholic Church, but the reality was that the ones that did were vehement. In general, the almanacs ignored all the Church of England dates because they were too papist. No Christ Catholic holy days, but sometimes they had the pro-Protestant, anti-Catholic dates in the almanac. In other words, Guy Fawkes Day was there up front in the early American almanacs. There were few books available in the colonies and even fewer libraries. Of the few religious books, there were many that were anti-Catholic. No that I could find evidence of pro-Catholic books, except in maybe college libraries and in some pastor's library, so they could read Catholic things and know how to attack Catholics. But there's one particular very popular book I want to mention. It was called A Master Key of Popery by Antonio Gavin. It was published in 1726. He was an ex-Catholic priest from Spain, supposedly once involved with the Inquisition, who escaped to England, became an Anglican minister, and he wrote a book full of all the usual anti-Catholic stuff. And because he was an ex-priest, of course, it carried great weight. It was very popular. And in fact, it is so popular that the fact that in 1773, at the eve of the Reformation, it was immediately republished. Why? To show people what we needed to fight against. Fifthly, had these Puritan colon colonials found their new Jerusalem free from the Roman Catholic Church? Well, first, it must be stated that when they arrived in New England, they found that their lives were always under the control of the English kings and the stewards. They thought they were free, but their presence was always there especially in 1625 when, of all things, the Prince of Wales, the future King Charles I, married, of all things, Henrietta Maria, a devout French Catholic, and when she was installed as queen in England, she brought with her an entire Catholic retinue, priests and all. In 1634, John Winthrop, the first governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, wrote with some foreboding that he had heard that the new colony of Maryland had been settled by immigrants, many of whom were papists, and did set up mass openly. In May 1647, even though no Catholic was known to have been living in Massachusetts Bay since its inception, the Puritan government enacted an anti-priest law which threatened with death, quote, all and every Jesuit, seminary priest, missionary, or other spiritual or ecclesiastical person made or ordained by any authority, power, or jurisdiction derived, challenged, or pretended from the Pope or See of Rome. In 1688, the glorious revolution of England, the Roman Catholic King of England, James II, was overthrown ending any chance of the reestablishment of Catholicism in England. In New York, where actually a fair number of Catholics had settled openly, there was some openness in the New York colony, the virulently anti-Catholic leader, Jacob Leisler, spread rumors of papist plots and false stories of an impending French and Indian attack upon the English colonies. As the commander-in-chief and eventually the lieutenant governor of the New York colony, he issued orders for the arrest of all reputed papists, abolished the franchise for Catholics, and suspended all Catholic office holders. And from then on until the end of the Reformation, Revolution, excuse me, it was nearly impossible to be a Catholic openly in New York. The growing presence of French Canadian Catholics along the northern borders worried them and sparked many conflicts. The Indians had always preferred the French, primarily because from the beginning both Spain and France recognized the value of the missionary influence in the establishment of their empires. You see, all the Catholic settlements included missionaries to the Indians whereas very few of the Puritan colonies did. There's only a couple that we even know of, John Eliot and a few others. Over 1,000 captives were taken in Indian trade, 
on border towns along the border with Canada, and they were taken into Canada. Many of these were adopted by the Indians to replace their own losses, but many also were traded and ransomed to Canada, to the Catholic Canadians. In 1707, Cotton Mather wrote a book called The Frontiers Well Defended. He wrote a catechism specifically to train young people to withstand the arguments of the Catholic priests and nuns in Canada should they meet with them during their captivity. And then in 1774, the passage of the Quebec Act was for many the last straw. This act by the English Parliament contains several very threatening components. Think if you were a Puritan New Englander and you heard this happening in Canada, what you would think. By order of Parliament, it extended the Canadian territory to include land that is now Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, Wisconsin, and parts of Minnesota. You're being surrounded. It also replaced the oath of allegiance so that it no longer made reference to the Protestant faith. And also it guaranteed free practice of the Catholic faith, allowing the Catholic Bishop of Quebec to be consecrated and thereby establishing Catholicism on their doorstep. In September 1774, this is the start of it all, right? The revolution. The first Constitutional Congress met. And their resolution, called the Suffolk Resolution, was to increase economic boycotts and stand up to the lack of representation that the British had allowed the American colonies. And of course, these are the calls for revolution that we've all heard of. But the resolution also stated this, that the late act of parliament for establishing the Roman Catholic religion and the French laws in that extensive country now called Quebec is dangerous to an extreme degree to the Protestant religion and to the civil rights and liberties of all America, and therefore as men and Protestant Christians, we are obliged to take all proper measures for our security. The First Continental Congress acted against the imposing Catholic threat up north. During this time, a now familiar figure began speaking out. Now, you may have just drunken his beer, but his name was Samuel Adams. Journalist and organizer of the New England Revolution stated that his simple purpose in life was the organization of the rank and file to take over control of the political state. Riley, this author of this book, points out that to attain this purpose, he inflamed the prejudices of New Englanders against England by pointing out that the acts passed by Parliament would lead inevitably to such slavery and, slavery and ruin as popery has caused wherever it was dominant. This dire result would be affected because the doctrines professed by the Catholic Church tended, quote, directly to the worst anarchy and confusion, civil discord, war and bloodshed, Hence, he concluded that members of this religious group should be excluded from toleration. That was Samuel Adams. Later, in, well, in 1768, he also proclaimed, I do verily believe, as I do still, that much more is to be dreaded from the growth of popery in America than from the Stamp Act or any other acts destructive of civil rights. Preaches, doesn't it? Is it true? How could they know? Number six, given all this, what about conversion to the Catholic Church? In the 14 years that the Coming Home Network has been around, we have worked with over 1,600 non-Catholic clergy, missionary, academics, etc., from nearly, I get this, 100 different non-Catholic traditions. A little over half of these have now converted. And if you add to this the thousands of laity who have come home every year to the Catholic Church through RCIA, it seems that there are a lot of conversions happening today. Praise God. But is this only a contemporary phenomenon driven by modern media outreach? No. 
There have been a constant stream of converts, lay, and clergy throughout the 20th century and continuing, and our library is full of books of conversion stories. All through the 20th century, there have been conversions. But what about earlier? We may have remembered in the newsletter a couple months ago, I wrote an article about a book we found published in 1907, 100 years ago, entitled Converts to Rome, which lists thousands, oh, excuse me, 3,000 American converts since the discovery of America, and that was as of 1907. What is amazing is that these converts were not limited to the, quote, usual suspects, Anglicans, Episcopalians, Lutherans, what were, but at that time were from over 15 different Protestant groups and included a bishop, 372 clergymen, three rabbis, 115 doctors, 126 lawyers, 45 U.S. senators and congressmen, 12 governors, and 180 military officers. The so point is that there were lots and lots of Americans open to the Catholic Church. But were any of these conversions from the colonial period, from 1620 to 1789? Of those colonials who had never ventured outside the colonies, who lived all their lives within the confines of the American New England Puritan Commonwealth, there were no recorded conversions from Protestantism to Catholicism during the entire colonial period. For those that lived in the colony. However, well why? The same old barriers, right? Ignorance, misinformation, and they didn't know any Catholics. Most of those people lived their entire lives without meeting one Catholic. They talked about priests and how bad they were, but they never met one their entire lives. However, and this is what's fascinating, if they left the colonies, or if they were taken out of the colonies by the Indians and given to the Catholics in Canada, where they came into contact with Catholics, where they were able to learn the truth about the Catholic faith, receive answers correcting any misinformation, then get this, one out of five of the captives taken to Canada became Catholic. And the majority of them refused to come home and preferred to stay in Catholic Canada than come home to Puritan New England. Many of them became nuns and priests, and we've got a long list of their biographies in our library. But there's one special convert that I want to just mention, and I'll talk a lot about next year, and that's Reverend John Thayer. Reverend John Thayer was born in Braintree, or born in Boston, of the famous Thayer family, he went to Yale, became an ordained congregational minister. He was chaplain to John Hancock during the Revolution. Staunchly congregationalist, had never been out of that Puritan conclave. When the war was over, ah, I'll go to Europe, do a little studying. The long story short, when he went to Europe, he converted to the Catholic Church, was ordained in France a Catholic priest, published his conversion story, of all things, in 1793, but then came back to be one of the first priests of Boston with this commitment. He was publicly announced that his mission was to convert his Puritan countrymen to the true faith. Next year, I'm going to talk about the fact how a lot of Catholics didn't like him. <laughs> Shut up. We're trying to become Americans here. That's next year's story. Well, in conclusion, what can we learn from all of this? In 1637, while all these English colonies, anti-Catholic, they didn't know many of them. You know, these people would fall under the statement in Vatican II that they are not guilty for the schism because they didn't know. But, that's up to our Lord Jesus. But while all this was happening, they were establishing Puritanism along the New England seaboard. A French Jesuit priest by the name of Jean de Brebeuf in the northern Canadian wilderness wrote down his, quote, instructions for the fathers of our society who shall be sent to the Hurons, end of quote. He began with these words, you must have sincere affection for the savages. 
looking upon them as ransomed by the blood of the Son of God and as our brethren with whom we are to pass the rest of our lives. Each one of us here has our own American tale. Each one of us. Our understanding of Catholicism in America has been shaped by our own channels of perspective, our own formation, and maybe our own prejudice, whether it's Protestant or Catholic. And we need to examine to what extent we are truly deep in our Catholic history. To what extent are we looking in, are we lacking in our understanding and appreciation of those sufferings and sacrifices that thousands gave to plant our church on this continent? And to what extent do we today take our faith for granted? Let us listen and hear this weekend to the speakers, not to bloat our minds with more information, but so that our hearts might be lit on fire with the same enthusiasm for the salvation of souls that was exhibited by all those Catholic explorers and missionaries and pioneers, whether lay or clergy, who ventured forth into this unknown wilderness, trusting God alone with their future. God bless.